Hey, Mr. B here. In this video, we're going to talk about the historical developments of fingerprints, specifically how fingerprinting as kind of a field of forensic science or a facet of forensic science came about, um, kind of when it started, how it evolved over the last couple hundred years, and what it ultimately has become today in terms of its, its impact on forensic science and the ability to solve crimes. Okay, we're not going to get into the intricacies of the minutiae patterns or the, the big classes of fingerprints. That's going to come in later videos. This one is all about the historical context of fingerprinting. So, how did it become a legitimate class of evidence or how it became an, a, a facet of, of, of all things forensic science? Okay, You cannot think of forensic science without thinking about fingerprints. You cannot really think about solving crimes and the importance of different types of evidence without obviously including fingerprints as one of those things alongside DNA as really really hard pieces of evidence that are individual okay because all fingerprints are individualized individual pieces of evidence so in the beginning Dr. Grew wrote a paper describing the patterns that he saw on human hands under the microscope okay he was a microscopist he looked at or noticed that people have these kind of intricate patterns located on the fingertips. He didn't really know anything about how they were tied to specific people. He didn't understand or investigate the fact that they were different. He didn't investigate how they became a thing, like the development of the fingerprints. Those obviously came later, but he was the first to observe patterns on the fingertips of people and then wrote papers on um, describing the patterns associated with those while looking at people's hands under a microscope. In 1788, so a hundred years later, um, Johann Christoph Andreas Mayer described that the arrangement of skin ridges is never duplicated in two persons. At this point, it was established that no two people have the same fingerprints. Everybody that was observed had different fingerprints, including relationship or people with a close relationship like siblings mothers fathers and offspring okay nobody has duplicated between two people the same fingerprints they are individual um, it still wasn't um, tied to forensic science but it was at the first time or for the first time described as being non-duplicated by two people so everybody's is different Okay, 1823, so another 100, you know, or another 40, 50 years, um, Jan Evinglist Perkin described nine distinct fingerprint patterns, including loops, spiral circles, double whirls. So he was the first to kind of characterize the fingerprints as nine distinct classes. Now, there will be future videos on these different classes of fingerprints and these different patterns, but... He was the first in 1823, the early 1800s, to um, start describing nine distinct fingerprints by looking at a variety of fingerprints. He determined that all of the fingerprints he looked at kind of fell within these nine classes. In 1856, Sir William Herschel began the collecting of fingerprints. He noticed uh, or noted the patterns were unique to each person and were not altered by age. So he was the first to basically say, Obviously, fingerprints are unique to individuals, and they're non-duplicated among individuals on the planet, but do they change over time? And his analysis of that question was, no, they are not uh, altered by age. Okay, Kind of an interesting concept, because somebody's appearance can be altered by age, their, um, their skin texture can be altered by age, their muscle mass and their body comp composition can be um, altered by age, but fingerprints are not. Very interesting. In 1879, so another 20 years later, Alphonse Bertillon, who was an assistant clerk in the records office of the police station in Paris, created a way to identify criminals using a list of physical measurements taken from prisoners. So he was just a, an assistant clerk in the records office, but he became interested in trying to identify criminals using um, physical measurements taken from prisoners and um, kind of created a way in order to do that. The system called Bertillonage was first used in 1883 to identify repeat offenders, and he was credited with solving the first murder using fingerprints. So at this point in 1879, or more you know, realistically in 1883, um, his method called Bertillonage was the first method used to 
actually solve a murder using fingerprints. And so from that point on, fingerprint analysis became a kind of a facet within forensic science as a whole. In 1888, so just five years later, after solving that first crime or that first murder with fingerprints, um, Sir Francis Galton verified that fingerprints do not change with age, verifying the observation that Sir William Herschel kind of noted in 1856. And he developed the classification system for fingerprints that is still in use today in the U.S. and in Europe. That method is called APHIS, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then last, 1896, so just another five or six years, Sir Edmund Richard Henry, with the help of two other colleagues, created a system that divided fingerprint records into groups based on whether they have an arch, whirl, or loop. Now, these are the three big classification um, groups for fingerprints, and each fingerprint card in the system was imprinted with all ten fingerprints of a person and marked with individual characteristics. We call that a tin card. There will be more information on that in class. You will actually do the tin card. You'll print a tin card, and there are future videos that go through um, how to print a tin card um, later um, in this series. Okay, so these are a few of the individuals that were um, instrumental in the development of our understanding of fingerprints. They are also instrumental in the development of fingerprint analysis as a investigative uh, investigative tool that is used by forensic analysis or forensic investigators. This is a tin card. Okay, you can see that all tin fingers, including thumbs and um, the kind of the palm print sometimes, um, as well as the information available to that particular person, um, are included in this particular tin card. Um, but Fingerprints are now taken digitally, so while TIN cards were or used to be printed manually, they are now taken digitally, which provides clear reference points. Um, we have really high-tech scanners now that can um, kind of discern individual minutia patterns better than ink can. A lot of times ink can smear. Um, if it's not done by a trained technician, the prints can be bad. Um, but now, like I said, we use really good digital scanners that provide these real clear reference prints um, that can be incorporated into online databases that we use to solve crimes now. By 2012, the FBI maintained that AFIS system, it's I-A-F-I-S, it is called AFIS or pronounced AFIS, had more than 76 million computerized fingerprints, mugshots, scars, tattoo photos, and other identification records. This is the um, kind of management system or the database that the FBI and local and state jurisdictions and, and local law enforcement uses in order to access criminal uh, files or criminal information files, which helps obviously solve crimes nationwide. AFIS contains information on criminals known and suspected terrorists, military personnel, and civilians seeking employment, including teachers. Okay, My uh, fingerprints have been taken several times. Um, obviously, those are on file. Um, several employment industries require fingerprinting. Um, anybody that requires a background check typically has to get a fingerprint um, on file. And anybody that has applied for licenses to purchase firearms. So if you have a, a, a license to purchase and carry firearms, you obviously have to submit um, to a background check. You also have to submit fingerprints because law enforcement and the FBI want to ensure that if you are in possession of guns, uh, you have not committed crimes in the past. Okay, this set of fingerprints has come to be called a tin card. We kind of established that. You would have all tin fingers that would be... Um, printed on this tin card. Now those can be done manually like this tin card was printed or it can be digitally with the use of a scanner. Um, obviously all of them now are being done um, digitally. So what happens after the prints have been taken and they're in this um, AFIS system? When trying to identify an unknown latent print, criminal scene uh, or crime scene investigators submit the fingerprint to AFIS which quickly searches its database of fingerprints and selects possible matches. So the way that these fingerprints would be analyzed now is that a fingerprint that is lifted from a crime scene, we call those latent prints. Latent prints, as you'll, as you'll learn in future videos, are prints that are not readily um, viewable or readily 
identifiable in a crime scene until you do something to make them visible, like apply fingerprint um, powder. They have to be lifted from a crime scene, they have to be submitted to this APHIS system, and then the system runs against all fingerprints in their database. When it hits on a match, the fingerprint analyst or the, the fingerprint tech would then have to manually identify or make sure that they are consistent, okay? A fingerprint examiner that is human makes the final decision concerning accuracy. Um, the way that this APHIS system helps us is that it does all of the hard work. It basically searches millions of fingerprints to identify a, a few that maybe fits the description based on maybe 95%, 99% accuracy, but it ultimately ends up being um, determined for consistency by a fingerprint examiner who has been trained to look for minutia patterns um, within the fingerprint. Okay, the system has improved speed and accuracy of identifying matches for both current and cold cases. Um, this APHIS system, really from a cold case perspective, has really helped because um, individuals that commit crimes often commit them again. And so just because they may have committed a crime in the 70s and got away with it, um, and the case went cold, if they commit a crime now and there was a fingerprint on file from a case or a cold case in the 70s that their current fingerprint hits on, um, they obviously can be tied or become uh, major suspects or major players in those cases that that have been cold for you know 30, 40 years. So um, everything now is done digitally. It's all kept in this, this APHIS digital database, and the APHIS system will soon be enhanced by advanced fingerprint identification technology. It's called AFIT. Um, and while our technology is improving, the database clarity is improving, the physical descriptors associated with minutia patterns are constantly being enhanced, and so our understanding of not only fingerprint analysis, but also um, the ability to use fingerprints and more quickly analyze a bunch of fingerprints is, is always increasing and becoming easier to do. So. You have a palm print, for instance, um, at a crime scene, okay? Is it significant? Well, it is because you'll notice that not just on the fingertips are your fingerprints, right? So there are several different minutia patterns within a palm print. And so by 2013, the FBI was integrating the ability to compare crime scene palm prints with prints collected at the time of arrest. Most of the time, or a lot of the time, um, individuals only leave partial fingerprints at crime scenes and those partial prints can include and often do include portions of the palm not just fingerprints so we needed a way in the you know the database to collect and process palm prints because you can actually gain a lot of information from these palm prints just like you can with fingertips about 20 to 30 percent of latent prints at a crime scene come from the palm or side of the hand from the little finger to the wrist this portion of an individual is, act, is often used in a lot of a lot of times to open doors or to push doors shut or to um, stabilize themselves against walls okay um, there's a lot of times this portion of the hand is actually what comes in contact with glass or doors or other uh, uh, objects within the crime scene okay these prints may be left on the back of a chair or a window or when a suspect pushes off a surface or uses a handle or doorknob um, like I said, they needed to have a way to access and analyze this portion of the of the palm, and that now is included um, post-2013. Um, they've been incorporated into this APHIS in order to do that. Okay, uh, that's all we got for this video. Um, there's more to come. There will be an entire series, so if you learn something, make sure you hit up those future videos. Come to class with your questions. See ya.